And without further ado, I would like to invite our panel on media bias in the perpetual spin zone up to the stage. Let's give them a warm welcome. All right, well, I am so excited to kick off this panel. Um, I think that this is a topic that I've heard a lot of interest in this room about, and we have just a fabulous lineup of experts um, to speak to you about media bias and the state of the media today. So we'll kick it off. Um, to my right, I have Molly Hemingway. She's a senior editor at The Federalist. Um, you've probably seen her on Special Report with Brett Baer. She is actually a graduate of University of Colorado, Denver, and Charlotte Hayes at the Independent Women's Forum described her as a lightning rod in debates about feminism and religious liberty. She has also been a longtime media critic. Next to her, we have James Toronto, who you heard of, um, from at lunch the other day. Um, Best of the Web was one of those columns where I think most people like it when they get attention from the Wall Street Journal. I'd heard from a lot of journalists that they did not like it when they got attention from Best of the Web because James is an expert at dissecting bad ideas um, in a hilarious way. And he also had these viral categories um, for bad journalism, including questions nobody, nobody is asking, news of the tautological, the Friedman Award, and uh, my personal favorite was when he referred to Martin O'Malley as an unidentified man throughout most of 2016. Um, next to him, we have Dan Negmir. Um, he is a political blogger and opinion editor for Colorado Politics um, a 25-year veteran of politics in this crazy state. Um, so he's, you really know what he knows what he's talking about. And then next to him, we have Wayne Loggison. He's the editorial page editor of the Colorado Springs Gazette, a uh, frequent writer for the National Catholic Register, um, a father of six. And one of the more interesting things I found out about him is that in the 90s, he actually helped arm and train a bunch of Boulder women when there was a serial rapist on the loose. Um, so I wouldn't mess with them. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll kick it off um, with kind of uh, an anecdote that I think is very telling about where media is today. And Molly, I'm going to have you summarize because I, I know we were discussing this the other day with the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Okay. So a couple days ago, it was major news in the New York Times and also the Washington Post that Gerard Baker, who's the editor of the Wall Street Journal, asked reporters who were working on a story about Trump's speech in Arizona to remove the opinion writing from the article. Now, that's just basic editing 101 to ask people to remove uh, opinions or uh, characterizations that are not factual from an article, but it is so rare in this media environment that it was actually major news in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And even more interesting to me was that so many reporters got on Twitter to condemn Baker. They were saying, uh, the way the Washington Post put it said, the Wall Street Journal isn't the only media outlet that is struggling with how to cover Trump. And I was thinking, well, they might be the only ones struggling because everyone else has just given up and they're just not trying to hold themselves to any, any journalistic standards at all. So with that, do you think that it's, I would like all of you to answer this, but do you think that objectivity in a journalist is something that is even possible um, or desirable? It's, it's a tricky question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that it's worth noting that the American model of journalism is not universal, and this American model that's really only been the case for the last several decades was to aim toward objectivity. And in the European press, there's not that same ethic that you aim toward objectivity. There, you just openly admit your biases and you kind of know what you're getting into. Um, I personally do think that things were more civil when journalists tried to restrain themselves from sharing their unbelievable amount of bias in their news stories. I think it's a good thing to try to achieve. I don't think it's ever possible, but I think it's a good direction 
if you care about keeping civil discourse in America. James, what do you think? Yes, I agree with that. I think that uh, objectivity is, uh, oh. oh, wait, no, I, sorry, I forgot to turn mine on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I, I think that's right. It's, uh, it's an aspiration, and it's, uh, if one works toward objectivity, recognizing that we're all human, we're all fallible, and uh, it, it's not an aspiration one can ever perfect, uh, one will do better journalism, at least by the standards of post-war American journalism, uh, which is what made uh, the news media an authoritative institution, as I discussed yesterday. Now, the New York Times and the Washington Post have both, in various ways, set themselves up as opposition explicitly op in opposition to Trump. The, the Times, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, Jim Rutenberg, their media columnist, wrote this piece in August saying Trump is such a threat that we have to give up on objectivity and fairness and balance and, uh, and cover him uh, in an oppositional way. Uh, this ran on the front page of the Times, so I argued at the time that it should be taken as a statement of policy. And uh, Dean Viquette, the uh, top news editor at the Times, uh, confirmed a couple of months later, he said, I think, uh, I think Jim had it exactly right. The Post is hilarious. They've uh, adopted this new uh, motto that appears on their website and on, I believe on the print paper, uh, democracy dies in darkness. Uh, now, it, it, it's kind of like the opposite of the Baltimore Sun's motto, which they've had forever, which is, it shines for all. It's such a strange slogan, uh, and it was adopted uh, sometime not long after inauguration. Uh, but it's just a weird, it's just weird from a marketing standpoint. Uh, put, as, put aside the journalistic questions. Uh, I mean, why would you adopt such a negative slogan to sell your own product? It's like, imagine an, a, a, uh, an organic food uh, company uh, adopting the slogan, people are poisoned by preservatives. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think that, uh, I think that they, have, uh, they have lost their way, and I'm not sure that, uh, that uh, being in open opposition is, I think my mic has stopped again. Oh, no, there, there we go. I, I think that they may come to regret this, uh, this open oppositionalism. Uh, it's, it's, it works very well for them commercially right now because there is a significant segment of the country that is uh, uh, beside itself over Trump. But you know, what do they do when? Uh, what do they do the next time there's a Democratic president, or if there's a, a more normal Republican president next? I, I, hard to see where they go with this. Well, one of the things that I've noticed, so certainly the national media is, is not aiming for objectivity anymore, but I, I've really appreciated state and local newspapers um, tending toward that more often. Is that your impression, Dan, in the state of Colorado, that those reporters are more able to be objective? I don't know that, the, uh, is mine on, by the way? Yes? Can you hear me? Am I? I have a cold, but you can hear, okay. I, I don't know that I would draw a line between state and national media, but I, I just, I honestly don't know. Um, what I would say, and what I was going to say is, uh, I, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach and say that I don't know that people can be objective, and therefore, since journalists are at least theoretically people, I don't know that they can be objective. Um, I would rather look for the pluralistic approach to the media that we do have in a free market society. And, um, of course, the digital age has ushered in so much diversity, in a good sense of the word, for a change, and it, the, um, there's a smorgasbord of media out there as never before. Sure, a lot of the old media have died, are dying, had to uh, restructure radically in many cases, but that has ushered in many new opportunities, um, new inputs, uh, new sources of information that were muted or silenced or not even thought about. 20 and 25 years ago. Um, I remember back in the 1980s as a reporter, so many of the things we take for granted now, I didn't even, obviously, I mean, I, not being a visionary, couldn't even have contemplated. I was just an ordinary guy, a working stiff, a reporter. And I couldn't have imagined what we now have at our fingertips, I mean, at, 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 on our phone screens. Um, and as a result, I think the, the offset to bias is more and uh, more varied sources of information, and rather than even trying to hope against hope for that perfect, objective, and maybe you know non-existent reporter, just a thought. 
fair enough. Um, and I, I'm glad you brought up the, the, the boom in new media and the increased competition, but Wayne, one of the things I'm concerned about is the gatekeepers of media. So I, I, Gizmodo had this great story uh, um, about a year and a half ago about how um, Facebook, several of their so-called curators, were deliberately suppressing conservative news. Um, websites like the Washington Examiner, um, like Newsmax, would have enough traffic and interest to qualify to trend on the sidebar on Facebook, but Facebook would not consider those sources credible unless CNN, um, unless the New York Times covered them. And so how do you think that this is going to affect media? Is it not just publications anymore that are determining content? Well, that's right. I think mm -hmm. that, uh, first of all, let me say that um, I want to correct Dan on something real quick. Journalists are not people, okay? They are something <laughs> other than that. I quote from one of my favorite movies, Almost Famous. He was never a person. He was a journalist. And uh, so anyway, uh, but no, that... I said theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Objectivity, I think, for, to go back to your original question, is not achievable. It is simply a, a goal that we push for. Uh, is uh, we, you know, having a panel discussion as to whether uh, the media are biased is a little bit like having a panel. And it was my idea, by the way, so I'll take the blame for that. Talked to Jennifer on the phone and said we should do something with media. And I said, how about media bias? I got off the phone and I thought it's a little bit like having a panel discussion as to whether the Vatican leans Catholic or not, so um, it's obviously biased. Is it uh, spilling over into the social media realm, the new media realm? Yeah, I think absolutely it is when it comes to the gatekeepers. The cool thing about new media and social media is it keeps reinventing itself. Uh, there's always some new product out there and there's always some new way to communicate. So that's the really good news right now is we can all be journalists. We can all be mass communicators. Now that's not particularly good for me because this was a really cool thing to do back in the 80s and the early 90s when you were the only one who could communicate, you know, you were part of a small group of people who could communicate with the masses. Um, the gatekeepers are trying to restore that. They're going to fail. Uh, there's a great quote, I wish I could remember who said it. The internet, the internet interprets uh, censorship as damage and routes around it. So that's what we're seeing in social media. That's what we'll continue to see uh, as the public gets to communicate to the masses. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, we can't obtain, we cannot achieve objectivity. We can only pursue it. And objectivity is sort of a new thing to the media. Um, if you go back, hundred years, nobody pretended to be objective. Most media did what I do, which I'm an openly, I'm openly now in the advocacy business as an editorial writer. As Jillian said, I uh, engaged in some sort of aggressive uh, activist journalism in the past, arming women when there was a serial rapist working in neighborhood and trying to get a lot of attention for that so that uh, the rapist would hear about it. Um, so that used to be the norm, was uh, non-objective journalism. Now we have the pretense of objectivity, and the big problem with that is the imbalance. Uh, nine, anyone who works in a news environment will tell you that the surveys are correct. 90 plus percent of journalists lean left. 90 plus percent of J school faculty leans left. So there's no question that we have a problem in the establishment media. And uh, when I started out in this field, uh, one of my early on jobs was as a paid intern at uh, Newsweek's Washington Bureau. And the, um, the standard then was to have three sources, if you could get them, to substantiate any sort of claim. Um, we've gone from that now to, I read a story recently where they, <clears throat> they did a story based entirely on one source that was Mikey Weinstein of, um, who runs a thing called Military Religious Freedom something or other. He claims that uh, some sort of militant uh, evangelical Christians are running the Air Force and the Air Force Academy. 
and I'll finish with this and move on, but he claimed that uh, Trump had a conspiracy going to uh, eject all Jewish officers from the Air Force unless they could prove that they were working on conversion to Christianity. <laughs> so they quote Mikey Weinstein, and to confirm all of this, they quote Mikey Weinstein saying that he heard this from unnamed sources at an unnamed <laughs> Air Force base. So that's, uh, that's where that standard has gone. That's easy to narrow it down because most of the Air Force bases have names. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we're... I'm still trying to figure out how Donald Trump became associated with the religious right. I'm trying to... <laughs> That's a fair point. Um, so I, I do think that reporting like that has taken a toll on credibility. Um, looking at a May poll from Harvard and Harris that found out that 65% of voters believe that there's a lot of fake news. Um, that includes 60% of independents and more than half of Democrats. And that 84% say it's, it's really difficult to know what to believe online. So James, I'd, you're really good at um, assessing the credibility of stories, how do you do it? How, how can readers look at something and determine whether or not it's credible and, and a good source to read? Well, I, how I do it is a difficult question to answer because I rely on years of experience and, uh, I, and a certain amount of uh, instinctual savvy, I suppose. So is it hopeless for the, the average reader that hasn't done that to determine what's, what's credible and what's not? Uh, I don't know if it's hopeless, but I'm not sure that I... Uh, I would have to take a long time to think about uh, what kind of advice to give on that. I'm sorry, I'm just not prepared to, uh, uh, to, uh, to answer the question. Uh, but I, the, this business about fake news is fascinating, mm -hmm. because uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, fake news began as a... Uh, it, pe people started talking about fake news, people who were Hillary Clinton supporters, after she lost the election, saying fake news cost her the election. It was. Uh, you know, these Russian sites that, uh, that published fake stories that were damaging about her or helpful to Trump. And uh, in fact, my last, my second to last best of the web column just before I went on Christmas vacation uh, was titled Fake Book, and it was about Facebook's efforts to combat fake news by assembling a group of uh, mainstream media organizations like ABC News and PolitiFact and so forth that were going to pass judgment on what other news, story, news uh, organizations were credible. Uh, and that's completely switched now. Uh, I, I saw Jim Acosta of CNN tweeted today, there's a hurricane in Texas. This is not a good time to complain about fake news. So the mainstream media is, uh, is, are on the defensive about this, uh, this idea of fake news. Uh, I wanted to mention also something about social media. There's a very interesting uh, legal issue here, which is uh, companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter have what are called common carrier status, which means they are not responsible, they're not legally responsible for content that appears on their site the way a media organization is. And you hear Mark Zuckerberg constantly insisting Facebook is not a media organization. This is why. He doesn't want to be, uh, he doesn't want to have to be legally liable if there is a tort committed uh, or uh, some other offense uh, on the Facebook site. Well, with these guys starting to exercise this sort of editorial control, and to some extent, I, I think it's necessary. I, I mean, you can't just have uh, uh, harassment and obscenity and that sort of thing. Uh, but with the more editorial control they exercise, the harder it becomes to claim that they're common carriers as opposed to media organizations. And it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out as a legal question. I just want to speak on this for a minute. I do think people, people who care about free expression and civil liberties in general need to be much more worried about corporate influence in this in this sphere. And it can be deceiving, you can think, well, conservatives have done a good job of going up against the media and winning. If you read analyses of people's decision to vote for Trump even, it's, a, it's surprising how many people will say explicitly that they didn't believe what the media were saying. Clearly the credibility is a major <coughs> issue. Credibility is off the cliff among Republican voters with the media, which is a good thing if you believe that the media have abandoned their position toward doing responsible journalism to the point that you shouldn't believe them. But these corporations that control discourse or 
that control the means by which we discourse are exerting greater control and they are extremely incentivized to support liberal, by which I mean social justice warrior, extreme liberal understandings of what is acceptable discourse or not. And while social media enables people to work around these things, it is also true that there are certain technological companies that control so much of the system that it is a threat. And I think conservatives are sometimes unable to see that because they instinctively support entrepreneurship and businesses and they don't see that some that sometimes the means by which our freedom is suppressed is through these same corporations. And actually I want to follow up on that. So you, you talked about the incentives for these corporations to be social justice warriors, to tip far left. Can you talk a little bit about both those incentives and what can be done about these gatekeepers that may have perverse incentives? I mean we are small government people. How do you fix that problem? It's a great question and I'm not sure. I feel like the first most important step is to just be aware that there is a problem. And it's not just in freedom of expression. You also see it in how corporations try to bully state legislatures that are attempting to protect religious liberty. I mean, some of the biggest setbacks that we saw in religious liberty protections in recent years were because corporations who have no trouble doing business in Saudi Arabia or China or places with horrific human rights violations said they would not do business in Indiana because they protect religious freedom. And people caved because it's very hard to go up against these corporations. So first off is just being aware of the problem. And I think it also might mean that conservatives have to be in a space that they're not usually comfortable with, which is um, boycotting or expressing themselves publicly or just showing themselves to be a force that has to be reckoned with if you want to maintain civil society and a tolerant society where people of different beliefs can work together in peace and harmony. So Dana, I want to ask you this question because you do blogging. Um, I've noticed that sometimes the stories that should get attention don't. And when we're talking about an era where news is disseminated virally, um, where it's easy to get a story out about 10 things that I hate about this, or you won't believe what this woman did in this situation, um, how do you draw attention to the stories that matter? You mean those aren't news? <laughs> Buzzfeed, right? They must be news. They're at the bottom yep. of every web page. <laughs> Same ones, too. How do you make stories that matter viral, though? Well, you know, one thing that blogging does, first of all, blogging is whatever you want to call it, and it was whatever, however you want to define it. But one thing that it does is it does allow you to take a second uh, bite at the apple and to maybe look again, sometimes, if done delicately, even at um, your own organization's um, hard news copy and say, Here's another aspect of it, without, without actually saying, well, actually, that reporter's a lefty, and I'm going to give you a different perspective on the very same story. But you can do that. And that, again, in a roundabout way, is um, to the credit of the digital age that's upon us for quite some time now. It is the diversification that I was talking about before. I mean, that was made possible. And uh, like I say, that taking a second cut at something was made po through blogging was made possible by the digital age. And so um, now you even have imps in news organizations, maybe even traditional mainstream media news organizations who will look at their own selves um, collectively in a slightly different way to present you a different view. Um, you know, maybe to some extent that's even true given the, I'll say this, the, you know, historic dichotomy between the Wall Street, our wanted, we all think we own the Wall Street Journal opinion page operation and, um, and the, the news hole of that paper, the news side of it. And um, they are not on the same plane from our perspective anyway we masses. And, um, you know, maybe there's even some of that re-examination that takes place in the editorial space, or I don't know, maybe you guys leave that alone. Well, I don't think we, as you say, I don't think we directly con contradict our uh, news side, but we do, uh, we do do a lot of our own reporting uh, on, on the editorial page, which is unusual. Uh, most, I mean, some, of, if you look at the Times, some of their columnists will do reporting but I don't think any of their editorials typically have uh, original reporting. Uh, ours often do. Uh, Jillian has written, more, writes more of these than I do on a weekly basis. I've written a few of them, but uh, uh, you can talk about that. Well, I'd actually, I'd, I'd love to know how you guys think the changing news cycle affects journalism, because one of the things that I'm noticing is the business model for publications is content-driven. You have to crank out content constantly. 
And I think sometimes that comes at the expense of, of credibility. So Molly, you're overseeing a lot, a very content heavy publication. How do you do that while still maintaining editorial standards? So in our case, we are an opinionated publication. Mm -hmm. We publish perspectives from conservative to libertarian and we like to host debates and we're not doing a lot of breaking news, although sometimes you it's You got quite there. a good scoop last night though. Yeah, I got a, I scooped Seb Gorka leaving the administration last night. Um, but the pace of the, the pace of journalism right now is utterly exhausting. And my husband, who's also a journalist, says that you know, he remembers a time when there would be a little downtime in political journalism. Like after an election, you could kind of take a breather. It's been like being on a roller coaster for the last two years and you're just you know, getting whipped around every which way. But what I think harms the credibility is not the pace, but the reaction to the news right now. So our, Journalists themselves are reacting hysterically, constantly, and it's hard to take people seriously when every day they are hysterical about a new thing that they forget about four hours later. And I have this, my own standard on this is, I will take it seriously if you can convince, if you can stay on this story literally for more than four hours, this worst thing in the world that supposedly happened out of the Trump administration. If you care about it for more than four hours, then I'll take it seriously. Like, then I'll actually look into it. If it doesn't even meet that four hour threshold, I just don't even bother like researching or finding out about it. But it's, it's very, I think it's important for journalists to keep their head about them, particularly if they think that this administration is somehow uniquely a threat. It's, it's just impossible to view them as serious individuals the more hysterical they get and the more they claim that this is the worst week the Trump administration ever had, or everything's obviously ending this week or whatnot. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, the issue of the quick news cycle and the short attention span. Um, Wayne, do you think that that's something that government is taking advantage of? I mean, objectively, it should take 20 to 30 days, which is a pretty long time to get a response back on a public records request. We often see that stretching on for months or years. In, in what cases do you see government taking advantage of that, and what are journalists to do about it? Well, we've actually had problems in our market where um, politicians openly are simply disobeying uh, public records laws. So, uh, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. If someone is uh, scouring their emails before you can ever make a request for them, which has become the norm, uh, I mean, the classic example is Hillary Clinton's thing with the sledgehammers and, and, and the cell phones. I mean, uh, just destroyed. And so we have a lot of protections for the public where the media and the general public, not that the media has any special right to information. Everybody has to say, any blogger, anyone who wants this information is protected by the same laws. But I think it's being uh, wholesale ignored um, <coughs> and, and to a growing extent. So that needs to be addressed legislatively. Um, if I could weigh in on something you asked about just a, a minute ago. Um, stories that aren't being told. I think uh, one of the things, there's, there's <coughs> obvious bias when you see a story that is reported in a biased manner. And uh, we see that all the time. We can come up with countless examples of that. But I think an even bigger issue, because the public doesn't necessarily see it, are the stories that don't get told because of the extraordinary left of center bias. There's not a conspiracy, it's just cultural. It just happens to be, well, there is kind of a conspiracy in that the J schools uh, have conspired to churn out left-wing journalists, but that's another story. Um, the stories that don't get told, and we try to be an editorial section that does original reporting for that very reason, to serve as a check on the news industry in the state, and even on, in, in our own even in our own company. So let me give you two quick examples. Um, Colorado's Clean Power, Clean Jobs Act. Uh, you hear a lot about how clean energy laws, um, the media will concede that it's costing coal miners jobs, for instance. Um, the story they don't tell you is one we tell a lot, for instance. Um, you go into a community like Pueblo, Colorado, where the uh, median household income is $20,000 below the rest of the state. And these clean energy mandates have caused their power, their monopolized power provider, 
to jack rates through the roof. To some, they're some of the highest in the country. And it's killing that town. People are losing homes. Cupboards are bare. Small businesses are closing. Now, the compassionate left of center uh, news media ought to be very interested in that story. They're not, because it doesn't go with the narrative of clean energy <coughs> policies. Um, so that's, that's one. Another great example is Medicaid. We've been trying to tell people how, um, you know, the, our roads are in terrible condition in Colorado. We have a teacher shortage that's getting worse. Teachers are fleeing to Wyoming in droves, where they can make $20,000 more per year and enjoy a much lower cost of living. This is all, well, I won't say mo all, but it is mostly a result of Medicaid expansion in Colorado, which the Denver Post recently conceded is uh, by covering able-bodied adults, we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year out of, out of the general fund that we weren't otherwise spending. Hundreds of millions of dollars a year is enough to solve the teacher shortage, the teacher crisis, and the highway crisis. It's never told that way. These things are all explained in isolation. So, <clears throat> Go ahead. Let me just add a workaday um, uh, uh, embellishment on what Wayne just said. And, and he's talking about some good, gave you some good examples of big picture journalism where you could do this big story that maybe looks at it a little differently that includes another perspective. In a typical Associated Press lead all story that moves on a given day, that's yet another update on one of these same issues, any of the ones that Wayne just raised. For example, let's take the Clean Power, Clean, clean job, job, Clean Job, whatever it was called, Act. That they, what it did is it, 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 it tried to make coal, I'm trying to summarize it, it, it tried to make coal go away much more quickly, and of course coal is mined in the state, and it um, tried to usher in the use of much more natural gas rationalized it in various ways, assembled a coalition in the legislature to do that, and, and it did it. Um, as Wayne pointed out, yes, they will acknowledge, sure, some coal miners will lose their jobs, and they're good paying jobs, and some communities, particularly in the West Slope, particularly in Northwest Colorado, where coal is mined, will be, um, will be affected. But uh, end of story, let's move on with what a good idea this is. I would argue that just in a workaday sort of way, there should be a little as, as we say in the business, a little nut graph. It's a little paragraph that kind of summarizes where we're at on this ongoing saga in, in this story that's yet another installment to this ongoing issue that just says, uh, yes, these, these workers, you know, on the other side of it, critics say, and just throw that in there, these workers will lose their jobs, and um, some economists estimate that, you know, it will cost the economy a total of an additional $300 million to usher in this new regime of energy. Doesn't mean it's good, doesn't mean it's bad, it's just providing um, an infusion of, of another perspective. And to do so on a regular basis, and I feel that it's in those workaday stories, it's a death by a thousand cuts sort of thing, in those workaday stories where that alternative um, perspective is missing, and it can be as simple as one sentence or one paragraph. And I realize it sounds like a, like a niggling little detail, but to me, like I say, in the, in the spirit of death by a thousand cuts, it's what really institutionalizes bias. And soon, the next reporter who comes along just starts out either at the Associated Press Bureau in, in, in cap, covering the Capitol in Denver or, you know, working for a community newspaper is simply going to move right in on the conveyor belt without, without missing a beat and think this is the way this story is covered. That one perspective will never be in the next 10 um, updates on that ongoing issue um, and it will be lost from the public record. So I think it's sometimes it's that little, it's those little add-ons that could make all the difference in news coverage. I'd like to go back to this uh, question of the news cycle, uh, because it seems to me the, the uh, fast-paced news cycle is a burden in a lot of ways but it, to journalists, but it's also a temptation. Uh, I mean, we want to get what we have to say out there as quickly as possible. We want to have a scoop. We want to have uh, those of us who are in the opinion business, we want to have our ideas out there. And uh, social media accelerates this even more. Uh, and. Uh, I, but it also has the effect of promoting groupthink because it's easier to, if you're expressing an opinion, to say something that all your friends are going to pat you on the back for than to say something that, uh, that is contrary and that you're going to be attacked for. Uh, you know, some of us enjoy the abuse, but most people don't. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, sometimes 
the truth gets out inadvertently as a result of this. And uh, I think of the example a week ago, Cheryl Stolberg, who's a reporter for the New York Times, had a tweet. She was reporting from Charlottesville, and she had a tweet in which she said uh, she was watching the fights between the neo-Nazis and the Antifa, and they seemed, both sides seemed to be equally hateful. She saw the Antifa people be beating up the Nazis. And uh, then the group thinks that set in. So she gets attacked by all of her left-wing peers and uh, you know, other left-wing Twitterers. And she then posts a, you know, she, uh, she goes through a quick, uh, I guess they call it a struggle session, and she posts a, another tweet saying, I'm rethinking this. Uh, I should have said uh, that there was violence on both sides. Obviously, racists are much worse than people who are against racism. So, uh, you know, but, but she inadvertently stumbled upon the truth, as John McLaughlin used to say. So it's, it's, it's not all bad, this uh, accelerated news cycle. All right, so we talked a little bit um, about advocacy journalism and the left's bias. And I think that's opened them up to things like the Jackie Rolling Stone story. Um, where it was pretty obvious to anyone reading that critically that there were holes and problems in the story, but that the editors didn't pick up on this and the reporter didn't ask the questions that she should have asked. Um, Molly, do you think that that's something that we should be more concerned about, that, that on the conservative side, as we're trying to engage in advocacy journalism, then it may be creating blind spots for us? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a human nature issue, so everybody should be concerned about it. But it's so funny, because that was actually a really big deal, and I think it's kind of been memory hold. What's interesting about that story, and so this is how conservatives should also think about it, is it was clearly part of an orchestrated campaign to bring about changes on campus dealing with sexual assault. And it seems like everybody in the media kind of agreed this was gonna be a big story. And as we learned, who was the, Sabrina Erdely, is that yeah. her name? Sabrina, Sabrina Rubin Erdely. Early. Okay. She admitted in the course of her reporting for Rolling Stone that she went hunting for the perfect gang rape story. And she needed that so much for her narrative that federal action needed to be taken on college campuses that she ended up working with someone who had made up a story. And more than that, though, I feel like everyone was doing their own bad thing in this bigger narrative, including ignoring the data. It's actually safer to be a young woman on college campus than to be a young woman off college campus. So women who go to school are less likely to be sexually assaulted than their, peer, their, their age peers who don't go to college. So the entire underlying basis of this major journalistic push that wasn't just at Rolling Stone but throughout all the major media, people were not asking the kinds of questions they should have or questioning their assumptions going in. And so yes, I mean that's, that's just true of everybody. I don't think conservatives have the kind of institutional power right now in the media to push that kind of narrative uh, across so many platforms as the left does, but everybody should be worried, yes. This reminds me of the, uh, I think they call it the ontological proof of the existence of God. It starts with the premise that God is perfect, and then I uh, posits that, well, one of the qualities of perfection is that he has to exist, therefore God exists. And it's sort of like this story. She's looking for the perfect story. She finds the perfect story. Uh, well, it, one, of the qualification, one of the qualities of the perfect story is it has to be true. Therefore, we assume it's true. <laughs> Sorry to get a little high-blown high philosophical there. Well, while we're on the topic of libel cases, James, I want you to talk a little bit about um, the New York Times and Sarah Palin and the significance of, of, of that lawsuit. Well, I've been saying for six and a half years, I've been railing against the New York Times for lying about the Gabby Gifford shooting. Uh, now what they did in 2011 was not libelous. Not because they didn't show reckless disregard for the truth, which is the uh, legal definition of actual malice that a public figure has to show uh, in order to prevail in a libel case. I think they did show reckless uh, disregard for the truth. They just were careful enough not to actually make factual statements that were defamatory about individuals, so there was no one who could sue them for life. What they did in the immediate aftermath of the Gabby Gifford shooting, but after it was clear that the shooter had no discernible political motives, I think I mentioned this yesterday, they blamed it on Republicans and their, uh, their uh, supporters in the media. Uh, and I wrote at the time that this was reckless disregard for the truth. What they did then after the shooting of Steve Scalise was unbelievable. Uh, 
the, apparently it's now come out in court testimony that Jim Bennett, the new uh, uh, editor of the edit, uh, New York Times editorial page, he's been there for about uh, a year and a half, I think, uh, whose brother, by the way, is the senior senator from the state, uh, he received a draft from an editorial writer, and he said it was just a, he testified that it was just a uh, summary of uh, the facts, and he wanted a, something more opinionated, more striking. So he added in this bit about how, uh, well, in this case, there wasn't the direct relationship to incitement that there was in uh, the Gabby Giffords case. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in that case, uh, Sarah Palin uh, put out, Sarah Palin's PAC put out this map uh, the original version of the story said, uh, with crosshairs over members of Congress, it was actually over uh, s states where members of Congress uh, had these districts that the PAC was targeting. By the way, a visual metaphor that many other campaigns on both sides of the political aisle have used. Uh, and, and so, I, I mean, he just, he, he embellished the story into a, uh, so that it was actually, it did actually have false statements about an individual. Sarah Palin has sued for libel. Uh, the case is in pretrial stages now, and uh, the judge is uh, considering the Times' motion for summary judgment. He rejected one motion to throw the case out. Uh, not sure where it'll go. Thanks to New York Times Company versus Sullivan, uh, the 1964 case, it's very difficult for a public, uh, a public official or, because of a later case, a, a public figure uh, to prevail as a plaintiff in a libel case. Uh, but I think that, uh, I think that uh, Palin has a pretty strong case, uh, even in spite of that. By the way, just one other point. Uh, New York Times has uh, been a uh, strong opponent of Citizens United, arguing that corporations don't have the right to free speech. Now, of course, it is, uh, the McCain-Feingold law has an exception for media corporations. The New York Times presumably would write that into the Constitution. Uh, but Citizens United is about the regulation of political advertising. People forget that New York Times versus Sullivan, the case that uh, set forth the, uh, the uh, libel standard, by the way, it was formally uh, styled New York Times Company versus Sullivan. It was a case about a political ad. It was a case about an ad the NAACP had taken in the New York Times criticizing some officials from Alabama. And uh, the Alabama officials won a uh, libel verdict, uh, surprise, surprise, in an Alabama court. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that the First Amendment very severely restrains uh, public officials' ability to win libel cases. Well, <clears throat> speaking about libel cases, um, the Trump administration, well, Trump in particular, is, um, suggested that perhaps that libel standard should be changed, that there should be, um, it should be easier to go after journalists who print untrue things. And that seems to be something that's resonated with a frustrated public, but what do you think about it? I think it's irrelevant because there's nothing that uh, there's nothing that uh, Congress or the president can do about that. Uh, this is a matter of Supreme Court precedent. I think it's a very well settled law. Uh, there is uh, so it's you know unless he can appoint uh, five more justices who I uh, agree with him on that, and I don't imagine that Justice Gorsuch does. Uh, I I know nothing. In, uh, Nothing about his record that suggests that he wants to reverse, uh, overturn New York Times versus Sullivan. So I, I, th I think it's, it's an expression of frustration on his part. I don't think it has much uh, effect. I do think there's one area of press freedom that will be interesting in the years to come, which relates to WikiLeaks, which is really a media outlet that is publishing national secrets. And you have seen certain members of Congress, the Senate, Ben Sass in particular, asking some questions, trying to understand whether there is a way to pursue action against WikiLeaks without harming press freedom. And I don't know, I mean, I could see some, if people are looking for a change in, in press law, that might be an area to observe, particularly if you're worried about the government encroaching on press freedoms. Well, except that, that the uh, issues about pr protection of sources, the uh, ability to publish confidential material and that sort of thing. Uh, there aren't really any laws at the federal level protecting the press in that regard. Uh, but they haven't been prosecuted. Like, they don't prosecute. Right. Them. So it's a matter of custom. There are Justice Department guidelines on this. Uh, and so it's kind, of a, it's kind of an informal agreement between the press and, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the government. And I think you're right that that could very easily break down.
Uh, and, uh, but but it's, th that's not a case in which, uh, an area in which the press has a strong claim under the First Amendment. So Trump has obviously been quite frustrated with journalists, and we're seeing this idea about oppositional journalism or antagonistic journalism. Um, as conservative journalist, I'd, I'd assume you'd describe yourselves as that, but what is the appropriate way to relate to this new incoming administration? How antagonistic or um, oppositional should journalists be? Uh, I think they should be as antagonistic and oppositional as they are to anyone in that uh, high level of power. I mean, we're the fourth estate. Whether we're on the right or the left, we're supposed to keep power in check. So, <coughs> but again, the, the way that the left-wing media is antagonizing this president is hurting the media more than it's hurting the president. He knows it, and that's why he likes to attack them the way that he does. That's a very good political strategy for him. Uh, one, of their, one of the tactics that fascinates me, because this is so over the top, is what the media are now referring to, and, and they picked it up from left-wing activists, as dog whistle racism, or dog whistle anti-Semitism. So we have uh, some media figures, including a member of the Washington Post's editorial board, who are hell-bent on uh, making a case that, not that Donald, I mean, they could make a case. We, there are a lot of people in here who support Trump and probably a lot of people who don't. You could make a strong case against Trump as president. No, they want to make him a racist anti-Semite, particularly an anti-Semite, even though he has a... Uh, you know, elevated a Jewish man to one of the highest positions in the White House. His daughter is Jewish. He sent them on the campaign trail, but apparently he was dog whistle uh, campaigning to anti-Semites. Um, this is a, a journalistic tool that's very dangerous because what it allows the journalist to do, I don't know, left-wing activists are going to do whatever they do, but journalists should be held to a higher standard, is to say, uh, this person said something racist, but it's in code. You didn't hear it because you don't have the wherewithal to understand the code. But I, the journalist, I'm special. I have a special education. I can interpret this for you, and I'm going to do that. And so we get things like um, symphonies. He said symphonies during a speech recently. And we are told by a Washington Post editorial board member and writer that this is dog whistle uh, anti-Semitism somehow. No, it was racism. It was dog whistle racism. Because only white men of European descent historically have written symphonies, which is not true at all. I mean, we went through and documented all the people who don't meet that description in the Western world who have written great symphonies. So it's kind of a racist assumption on his part to begin with <laughs> that only white people can write sym symphonies. Uh, another word, uh, we all heard Jim Acosta accuse the president of anti-Semitism for saying cosmopolitan. Now how absurd is that? Nobody of right mind, nobody, I mean, no reasonable person is going to believe that that is anti-Semitism but the media are starting to play this more and more over and over again. And it's just an incredibly dangerous tool, not against the president again, but against them. It's, well, let's it's think implosion. About, let's think about this metaphor of the dog whistle, which, by the way, I've heard this dog whistle stuff for, it seems to me, at least 20 years. This is a, this is a fairly common uh, metaphor. What is a dog whistle, a literal dog whistle? It's a whistle that uh, emits a... Uh, sound at a very high frequency that's outside the range of the human ear, but the, a dog can hear. So if you can hear the dog whistle, that means you're a dog. <laughs> Think about that the next time somebody claims to hear a dog whistle that you were theretofore unaware of. So I, on the point of how to cover Trump now, I think the entire problem and I don't honestly know how to deal with this, but the entire problem was the vacation that journalists took for eight years in the previous administration. And so it, there, was, there were so many stories that could have been covered, so many scandals that people were very much interested in, uh, that they would have loved to have seen 
real effort at, at getting into it and understanding. I mean, I, I cover this stuff, and I still don't understand all the contours of the IRS scandal because journalists just decided it wasn't that big of a deal. And when you have done that... They were in favor of what the IRS was doing. Some of them made that clear. Yes. And when you do that, it just renders you completely unable to cover this administration. And so I, I worry about that because I do believe a strong press is needed to hold people accountable. And I don't know how to regain that credibility for them when they are so erratic in how they determine whether to be journalists or not. And that is, you know, that's kind of a crisis. Dan, how would you rate the Trump administration on transparency so far? I'm far from the best judge, and, you know, I cover middle American. I, I'm a middle, middle American journalist covering middle American affairs. So from middle America, my opinion's probably no more valid than anyone's here. Um, you know, he, he has shown, in some of the incidents I can think of, he has shown sort of an indifference to calls for transparency for um, particular meetings he's held or something like that. And however consequential or inconsequential those meetings are, um, of course, much will be made of them by the, by the national media we've been talking about. So, um, I'm, frankly, I see a lot of that through that filter. Uh, again, I just keep coming back to the same thing for me, which is, I, what I view is actually a pretty cheery development, and that is the diversification of the media in the digital age and the fact that we are doing end runs in ways that we as a society didn't before. We were reliant um, on a relative handful of major media to filter everything out of Washington for us, and that's just not the case anymore. Um, there's a downside to that, and there's a lot of downsides to that, and we know that. I mean, it requires a lot more judicious consumption of media than was the case in the past, much more discerning eye and ear. Um, yeah, you have to be a better judge, a more discriminating judge. Um, there I go, using another racist word now. But it's, it, you're, with, with that said, we have more opportunities to see more and different angles on, on what were once mo uh, stories that were just presented to us in a monolithic, monochromatic kind of way that said, this is it, I'm Eric Severi, this is CBS News, and I'm telling you how it is, and you don't need anyone else to tell you. And I think that, um, so I, I kind of shifted gears here a little bit. I, I, keep, I, I agree that there should be this. workarounds to it. But the, the fundamental issue of transparency, I mean, we saw the Obama administration claiming to be the most transparent in history when anyone who worked with it knew that it was unequivocally one of the least transparent administrations in history. And this is a bipartisan issue. So Molly, how do, how do you think Trump is doing? Is he making changes that need to happen? Well, first off, there were problems with the Bush administration on transparency. Obama was worse. When you look at metrics, just how long it took to fulfill requests for Freedom of Information Act <clears throat> requests or the amount of information you got. And I see no reason to think that the trend is different between Bush and Obama and Obama and Trump. But this is the entire problem with covering Trump as a person. Because as a person, he's actually not just transparent, he's way too transparent. He's like <laughs> giving a running dialogue or monologue, you know, at all times. You know exactly why he fired James Comey, because he said it. And so the media being upset with Trump, in part for being transparent, is, a, is the weirdest media reaction ever. This should be just a gift to you as a journalist. And at the same time, they're missing all these other stories that are happening at the agency level. And as a conservative, that might make you happy because like crazy stuff is happening, you know, deregulation and, and different uh, changes that are ma being made at the agency level. And they're just not covering those because they're so obsessed with what he tweeted transparently. I think Molly makes an important distinction here. I, when we journalists talk about transparency, we have in mind basically cooperation with journalists, right? releasing information that we can use to, uh, to, uh, to make good stories. Uh, and I certainly don't deny the importance of that, but I suspect that to a non-journalist, this looks like a very transparent administration, precisely for the reason you just said. I mean, okay, so the uh, pardon of Joe Arpaio last night, uh, you know, some people were saying I was part of the Friday night news dump. Trump said he was going to do that pretty much on, uh, on, in his speech on, what was that, Tuesday? He said, you know, I, I think that Joe's going to be pretty happy with what happens. I mean, he, he didn't make any, he didn't make, but that's of no use to journalists because everyone heard it. The only thing journalists can do is quote that. You don't get a scoop out of it. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's an interesting question, and I, there are different ways of thinking about transparency. All right, so I want to open up this up to questions in just a second, but before I do, 
James, you talked a lot about the crisis of credibility um, and authority. And I, I wanna talk about how the media can regain its authority and its credibility. Um, any thoughts, panelists? I do. Sorry. Uh, I really thought that this wake-up call that happened in November where the unthinkable happened, that Donald Trump was elected, that should have been a huge alert to journalists, and particularly at the management level, that they had completely misread the country and they were not doing a good job covering something as big as a presidential race. So I think what should have happened would be a, sort of a humbling and, a, and maybe a, a period of apology, apologizing for how poorly they covered that race, and then making structural changes. And the structural changes I think would be helpful would be just intentionally trying to bring in people with different perspectives than that tiny, narrow groupthink that pervades every newsroom. Really trying to get people from different places, and then maybe some structural change, and, and also promoting them, not just bringing them in as reporters, but bringing them in as assignment editors and whatnot so that they can help craft stories so that they're not so narrow. And then making changes, I do think a really big problem is that, as three of us are in the media in New York or DC, these are places that are very out of touch with the rest of the country, and the type of people who like to go to those places are different than people who are normal and healthy. And um, <laughs> so, so you need to make some kind of change where you're actually bringing in viewpoints from bureaus outside of those areas. Yeah, I suspect that's easier said than done because the uh, top managers of news organizations, the people who would make these decisions, I suspect are largely part of the group think. Uh, and they would be swimming against the tide if they, uh, if they tried to do that. Uh, what makes it even more difficult uh, is uh, that Trump is conducting a very brilliant media strategy of attacking the press. And the press, uh, journalists don't seem to be able to resist taking the bait. So you had this thing where he, I guess he retweets this GIF file of uh, a, a scene from World Wrestling Entertainment, which featured, which actually featured Trump, uh, and uh, so you know it's a stylized fight, and he pretends to hit some guy, and the guy pretends to fall over. Uh, I mean, I assume it's fake, uh, but somebody has, had superimposed the CNN logo over the guy's head, and journalists just went crazy. It's like he's encouraging violence against journalists. Come on! I uh, and then CNN. Uh, goes out, and uh, I guess they tracked down the guy who uh, who put together the GIF, and I uh, interviewed him, and and he was very he issued a statement. He was very contrite. He said he would never do anything like this again, and he had been on these I uh, I you know hate websites, but he feels bad about it. He disagrees with it, and then CNN said uh, the story said CNN is withholding his identity because I, I, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact words, but essentially they're withholding his identity because he's contrite. So long as he's contrite. Right, but, but we reserve the right to reveal it if, if, <laughs> if anything changes. <laughs> he changes his mind. And so, I mean, you know, they're picking on some random person somewhere who put together this stupid thing that the President of the United States happened to, and I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think they got much uh, uh, sympathy from anyone on that. I think even people on the left were critis critical of them for that. That was just, that was just insane. But this is, you know, this is how people react when they're attacked, and particularly when, particularly people who like to think of themselves as being in positions of authority. And uh, I, I think it, I, I don't think that, uh, this is going to get better anytime soon. I think, uh, I think it has to get worse first. Um, my take on that is that, that um, James is right. It's easy, far easier said than That's done. That's a good to, take. To, 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 <laughs> <laughs> always my start. And it's far easier to, said than done to try and change any of the organizations. But why try? I mean, again, it's praying to a false god. You know, you're not going to change Ball. Ball is who he is because he never was. And so don't make CBS um, this, this thing on an altar before which you bow, uh, or CNN or anyone else, or the New York Times. Um, they do enough self-worship as it is, right? <laughs> so instead, uh, revel in the fact that we have at least <clears throat> some semblance of a free market still in this society, and, and that in conjunction with the technological change of the digital age, and I, I know it sounds Pollyannish, but I really believe this, not only is ushering in, has ushered in, 
just a plethora of new media that offer different perspectives and that just do end runs on these really, I'll, I'll go an extra step and say what, what in many cases are, to put it kindly, legacy institutions, to put it a little more bluntly, dinosaur institutions. And, and why worry about reinventing them? They're going to be what they are. They will, in fits and starts, make some changes. They'll make some, sometimes even, and you know much more about this than I do, make some, make, they, they'll even make some funny, almost unintentionally comical gestures about reform to get a conservative viewpoint in there. But the reality is that that's, that's <coughs> slow coming, late in the game, and who cares? Um, I think it's far more important to understand that there are all, uh, there are many new and varied kinds of media out there that have come up and that are going to provide these alternative views. And uh, hey, let the dinosaurs be there for, to be Trump's punching bag. And um, that serves him. Um, they get a black eye, as has been observed. They take the bait. Um, it's great entertainment. And meanwhile, you have new alternative routes for getting good information that, you, that worked the case several decades ago. All I can say is I concur with uh, Dan on that. You can't, you're not going to change the legacy media, dinosaur media. It's cultural. You'd have better chance turning California and New York blue within our lifetime, or red within our lifetime, so that's not going to happen. Um, it's, it's, it's just deeply entrenched. But, you know, Fox News came along, what, uh, 20 years ago? And uh, became the leader in cable television for many, many years. Uh, more viewers than the other cable news networks combined, and that is because they did find a niche, they, they filled a niche that was missing because of the left slant of the rest of the mainstream media. So, you know, there are corrections that take place. The problem with changing the culture of the media is finding journalists who can help you do that. Very difficult to do. I mean, Fox found them all, pretty much. And, <laughs> you know, we, we our, our company, is owned by someone who wants a center, you know, wants a middle of the road, uh, objective media outlet. He happens to be uh, a center right person, and um, but it's it. We try, we try very hard. It's just very difficult. Ninety, like I say, ninety percent of the people coming out of J schools, probably ninety plus percent, would not fit the center right definition. I would just add a small point. Uh, I used to think that competition from Fox News and talk radio and uh, other uh, more conservative outlets was going to have a corrective effect on the mainstream media. And I think, in fact, it's turned out to be the opposite. Because if conservatives stop watching CNN and start watching Fox News, then CNN's audience becomes more liberal. And so uh, the, the pressure on them is to be more liberal. And it actually seems to be working for them right now, at least commercially, because CNN and MSNBC are having great ratings because there are a lot of people who uh, are sympathetic to that view and, uh, and, and are willing to tune in. All right, well, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, you have five dinosaurs up here and you get to ask the questions and we're gonna be your punching bag. Um, questions though, not comments. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think it was in the last year, maybe two, the Kaiser Foundation came out with a study that in the tweener ages, those kids are spending 11 hours a day on media outside of the classroom. So they're looking at the gamut. How do they know what's true, what's factual, and what's not? Because that's our next generation. How can we be responsible to them? I grew up in Colorado and at a time when there, were the, there was the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News. And I actually found the simple act of reading both of those papers so instructive in becoming a more informed media consumer. You would just see slight changes between the two stories covering the same event. And it would make you realize that the reporter's perspective actually played a big role. Or looking at you know, how they covered religion stories or abortion stories differently. The editorial pages were pretty different too. And it just got in my mind at a young age. So I wonder if that's not one way, if you have a young person, to just <coughs> provide them with a variety of stories on the same topic so they can start to think a little more critically in a natural way. Yeah, I will say I think part of this is starting with education and our colleges aren't doing a good job of it. Um, one of the more disturbing stories that I read this year was the Wall Street Journal. Um, looking at this, this test that students take their freshman year of college and their senior year of college, 
And about, at about a third of the universities, students had not improved at critical thinking during those four years whatsoever. And in some cases, their critical thinking skills had actually deteriorated. Um, so I find that very disturbing. I think that's part of the reason that these campus culture wars and exposing people to controversial ideas is so important. Uh, real quick, I just think, um, yeah, I think you really nailed it there. The, the problem is, is more cultural and more educational than it is any of the media right now. Children really are not watching TV anymore. I have six of them. They don't watch television. Television doesn't do anything. It's all top down. They're, you know, the, what, what the media that you're seeing them use is Roblox or, you know, things where they can build something, things where they interact with it. So I think the media is actually maybe perhaps less of an influence on their uh, social thinking and their political thinking than it ever has been. Yeah, so we're just going to deflect that punch to let academia. Me, let me, let me add maybe one maybe encourage that. them to play video games instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of reading the news. YouTube. That's where all the kids, for better or for worse, that's where kids are turning. And it is uh, this noisy mess, but, and there are parent filters that can be applied, but it's, um, okay. it's unfiltered in terms of the slant of what you're saying there. Although mine are mostly looking at instructional videos on how to blow up your house or something like that. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's, that's indicative. YouTube is, is indicative, I think, of what kids' natural consumption habits are in the digital age. They want the, this, Exactly. They want to resist the top down. They're, they are the new, they're the real resistance. They resist the top down. They're, TV, what's that? That's why cable's hurting. Um, they want something that they can select and that they can zero in on using, you know, Lord Google's uh, hocus pocus machine and find what they want. And, and there's a video out there on it for better for us. Hi, um, my name is Helen Rowley. I'm a contributor to the Federalist. I wonder if you all can address the long-term unintended consequence and the collateral damage of all this fake news rhetoric. Just a, two quick examples. I noticed that um, some Trump supporters will regard any criticism of uh, President Trump, even constructive criticism from like a Wall Street Journal's opinion page as fake news. I also noticed some Chinese media would call uh, American media's uh, any critical reporting on China, especially on human rights issues, as fake news. So what's the long-term consequence of the uh, media bashing and the fake news rhetoric, and will American media ever climb out of it? Before anyone answers that, I just, I just have to say, Helen, I love your writing, and it's so nice to actually get to meet you. Your work on you know, looking at what's happening in China and also making some helpful comments about how, what we can learn from that has been great. So I encourage everyone to check out Helen Raleigh's work at The Federalist on that topic. Well, I just, I think you need to, the, the public is the only way you could, we have a free market of media in this country that's just expanding all the time because like I say, anyone in this room can now be a mass communicator, which is a great thing, but the audience needs to be very discerning. I mean, there's obvious, well, it's not always obvious, but there's fake news that where somebody just simply makes something up because it's a great story. And there are people making a lot of money doing that. I mean, what a fun thing to do. Just think of something the audience would love to hear that is so absurd but slightly believable, put it out there and somehow monetize it. That's, that's going to be going on. So I think you just really need to um, rely on brands. Does, does, am I getting this from somebody that has any kind of process in place? Any, in, we, I mean, we at the Gazette and, and our associated media uh, products, we have a, a lot of process, a lot of checks in play. Everything before it hits publication goes through three or four people who are supposed to dissect it and tear it apart and make sure that it's real. So, you know, and, and if we stop doing that, pretty soon people stop believing us. Like, they, you know, there are some much larger uh, media organizations out there with far less of a reputation because they've stopped doing that. So you just really need to be discerning as an audience, I think. Yeah, I'd add to that. I, I hope um, that conservatives, because we don't view government as the solution, are less inclined to engage in this sort of cult-like worship of a political leader than the left has been. Um, that said, I do think it's really important for conservative journalists to, to be critical and to point out when there is ongoing corruption. And I, I really hope that that finds a receptive readership. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Vandersteel. I'm a conservative internet TV uh, news host with Your Voice America. 
what we have run into and seen as a conservative program is extreme censorship on the platforms that we broadcast. That notwithstanding, what do you see as alternatives for us in the field of censorship? Is it going to go out and get new funding to build our own platform, start from scratch, build our own hybrid? Are we going to be able to successfully overcome what we're seeing in our own media, what we drive every day, where we see our numbers fall off a cliff because they don't like what we're saying? And we have the analytics to back it up. YouTube censors us like crazy, Facebook has shut us down, and we don't use radical language, we're not uh, using felonious language, and we're not singling out any particular religious group, but because we are supportive of the conservative voice, we have seen this as a real, as a real problem. So we're looking for some answers, you know, what are you all seeing? Are you seeing other folks in the conservative world just going out and saying, we're gonna build our own social media platform? We have people approach us, but I want to see what you all think. Well, there is a, uh, an alter a Twitter alternative that was set up after Twitter was blacklisting and uh, shadow banning various people called, I think it's called gab.com or gab.co or something like that. Uh, the problem with this is uh, what they call a network effect. Uh, for example, uh, IBM and Microsoft became dominant players. Well, the IBM PC uh, model, which really, really ba was based around, it was an open hardware architecture, but Microsoft became the dominant uh, operating system because everyone was using it and people were able to write programs for it and, uh, and interchange and so forth. VHS, even though it was technically inferior to Betamax, became the, uh, the uh, primary uh, videotape format because Betamax was proprietary. Uh, everyone made VHS systems, so there was the network effect and companies stopped making Betamax uh, uh, tapes. And we see this in social media too. Facebook and Twitter uh, and Google all benefit from this network effect. A lot of people use it. I, you know, I would rather use something more uh, open than Twitter, but I haven't bothered with Gab because Twitter is where everyone is. So I'm not sure what the answer to that is. It may be that, uh, uh, that there will be some uh, antitrust actions at some point. Uh, it may be that, uh, uh, that there will be legal pressure brought to bear from what I talked about earlier about the distinction between a media company and a common carrier. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure, but it's a very interesting question. So I don't have a good answer either. <laughs> but um, I do think there's something interesting that's happening right now in a political sense, and it was well articulated by Rich Lowry in a column for Politico yesterday, I think, where he asked if opposition to the media is the new unifying principle on the right in the same way that fighting communism was a unifying principle on the right, which brought together you know, strong national defense conservatives and libertarians, and everybody kind of had this common enemy that they knew to work against. And so I think that was a very provocative and perceptive thing he picked up on that media, and that can be a big thing in terms of corporate control of the media and how it's limiting speech, or just the lower level stuff we're talking about, like bias, is something that for all the differences of opinion that people on the center to the right have, is something they all recognize as a problem. And as people recognize it's a problem and begin thinking through these things, I think we are gonna get some answers. And we're also gonna get some more corp corporate, meaning a large group of people, pressure on some of these organizations that are seeing how much they can get away with. All right, over here on your left. Jimmy Sangenberger, uh, six days a week, I'm a radio host in Denver, and I got my start at college campus at Regis University where I started doing radio talk show and also was a student newspaper editor and a uh, uh, columnist there. One thing that I always did was I stuck to opinion because I knew that I was too biased to, to uh, kind of jump into the fray of, of being objective journalist. And I wonder when we talk about what's going on at college campuses today, how much the education system there in higher ed, and especially in journalism schools and other broadcasting education programs, is adversely affecting the bias and, and continuing to perpetuate that bias that we see in the media. And if there's any sort of uh, actions that can be taken to, to begin turning the tide on the idea that you can be opinionated in your journalism as opposed to the right way, which is to try to be as objective or at least as balanced as you can be. Thank you. Uh, can I, as far as your question as to how much of an effect it's having, it's having an enormous effect, not just in the J schools, but in the law schools and every other discipline. And, 
in, at the university. Uh, there is, an, and, and that is a conspiracy, actually. I, I don't think that there's a left-wing conspiracy in the media. I do think that there is a bit of a conspiracy in academe. We've seen the University of Colorado Boulder take some rather extraordinary actions, b better than anyone else in the country, except for a few sort of small, smaller schools, thanks to Mr. Benson over there. <laughs> to combat that, and he has shown that you can do it even in Boulder, even in the People's Republic of Boulder, you can, you, you can take this on. But until it's taken on at that level, Jimmy, I don't think that there, I mean, that, that's an underlying problem and it's enormous. And I mean, I have had, well, I, I could go into multiple examples of the indoctrination that goes on in, in J schools and the rest of academe, but I think we all sort of understand, I don't think we need to, to debate whether or not that's true. Yeah, there, there are a couple areas that I see this campus culture really bleeding into journalism. The first is the idea that there are some ideas or questions that you cannot raise or cannot ask. I think the second one that I'm seeing a lot of is the idea that only members of a group can cover that group objectively. So for example, in Philadelphia last year when there was a Black Lives Matter protest, they were quite explicitly asking anyone who was not black to go to the back and to make room for black journalists to be able to ask the questions and cover it. And I think the third thing that we're seeing that not only has implications for journalism, but for novel writing and for television and for film, is this idea that if you are not specifically choosing people to tell their stories, that that constitutes the erasure of a culture or a people. Um, we saw this with the guy who directed 12 Years a Slave, um, did a, a series on the far left in Great Britain, and he was criticized for the erasure of black British women because his female protagonist was an Indian woman who was actually, in, that was part of the black power movement in the UK. So I think those are three ways that we're seeing the campus um, culture try to assert itself in storytelling, whether it's journalistic or fictional. And I really hope there's pushback on that because nobody has a monopoly on the ability to tell stories, and truth is something that should be universal. Um, if I could just interject real quickly, I think uh, both at, at, in academe, where journalism is sort of born, where the, the old school journalism is born, uh, and in the institutions of journalism, and I, have, I, I remember being a young journalist at a newspaper in the Midwest, and um, being told in no uncertain terms that my political views, which I had revealed to some friend colleagues, had better be kept to myself because they weren't the correct ones at that newspaper and I would be fired for that. I felt that pressure the whole time I was working in the trenches as a reporter and like I say, starting out at uh, Newsweek magazine when it was an actual real publication, uh, we had a bureau chief, uh, most of you may have heard of him, uh, Morton Kondracki, who had just come on center right, not very far to the right, however, and it was actually, it, it was openly a scandal that Catherine Graham had hired him to run the Washington Bureau of Newsweek because he wasn't properly far enough left of center for the culture of Newsweek magazine. And Draghi is actually center left, but maybe he's right by Newsweek standards. <laughs> I like your point. I see your point. I do think there's such a thing as a stupid question, but there shouldn't be any such thing as an offensive question for journalists. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, <clears throat> with respect to the Black Lives Matter incident, you know, I, I wonder if they weren't making a tactical mistake there because, um, you know, leftists of color could find no greater allies than the um, white guilt-ridden liberals in some of the major media. So, um, who knows, by ushering black and other journalists forward they, and giving them pre a preference on questions, they may have actually exposed themselves to more, um, you know, uh, penetrating questions. So, uh, but I, I also wanted to say to Jimmy, um, I think there's a workaround on that too, and that's and this is something that's been around a long time because even old school liberal journalists, 30 years ago and much longer ago, were saying, you don't have to go to journalism school to be a journalist, and um, and I think there is this, of course, institutional bias in the in the journalism schools. They are what they are. Again, another dinosaur. It is what it is. I'm not saying they don't. Um, provide some useful tools, but you don't need to go to them to pick up those tools. Um, I, do, I, I do not have an undergraduate degree in journalism, I, and I was a, a regular, um, unbiased reporter for years before I was anything else. I do have a graduate degree in it. Um, I don't think I needed that. Uh, you don't need a journalism degree to be a journalist, and I think 
increasingly in society, in an ever more literate society, and I think with a group of people like we have right here, all age groups, both sexes, all anything, backgrounds, um, there are plenty of you, probably not all of you, but there are plenty of you who can turn a phrase well enough, who can maybe, some of you maybe even are gifted writers, but you're not journalists or you don't see yourself such. You can be. You can communicate as well as anyone and you can harvest information as well as anyone. Again, the democratization that empowers that uh, came with the digital age. And, you know, it's a complicated process, but you have um, outlets. You can tap into your own abilities and you have outlets for them as never before. But for the most part, to get an entry-level professional job in journalism or anything else, you need a, at least an undergraduate degree. Yes. I don't happen to have one, but uh, that's a, I'm an unusual case. A uh, degree, I, but not and, necessarily and, in journalism. And, and, which, which means, you know, the only way to completely avoid this campus nonsense is to do what Jillian did and go to Hillsdale. Huh. So, does anyone have the time? I want to make sure we're not keeping you from lunch. Um, we have one more question. One more question? Okay, perfect. Three minutes to, or two minutes to twelve. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Mitchell Gunner. I'll try to make this quick, but uh, I'm a civil engineering major at Clemson University, and I do a lot of reporting on kind of the campus craziness stuff. He has done quite good reporting for us. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. But uh, I guess my, my question is, what advice do you have for young journalists? Um, obviously, I'm not a journalism major, so I'm trying to get into the fields. So, uh, I just want to get your thoughts. Thanks. I would give the advice of stay away from the pack. Don't go with the pack. Avoid peer pressure. Avoid the need to be liked at the cocktail party. And you will create a niche for yourself. Okay. That you'll really separate yourself out from, from everyone else. And um, so that's, my, that's the best I can give you. Hey, you, you have a, you're working toward a civil engineering degree? So, so you could make an honest living? <laughs> but you are an example of what I'm talking about. You don't need a journalism degree. You're a smart guy, you're articulate, and you know how to go after information you want to find out. Done. I would say read a lot of history um, and also find good mentors, James and Mary. Thank you. When I was a journalism undergrad, they would bring in guest speakers, and their advice always was don't go into journalism. Uh, the pay is terrible, it's a grind, it's, and uh, I always kind of thought, well, I don't know, I think I still want to go into journalism. But that was probably a good filter for the people who weren't cut out for it. And uh, I'm trying to think of any of my, uh, any of my, any people who were in my classes who uh, are still in journalism. I can remember one who's, well, I can think of one who works for a small paper in California. You're already doing a good thing by not studying journalism. And I studied economics, and I love what that gave me in my, in my journalism. But if you can deal with the lack of money, it's just a wonderful line of work. <laughs> and you get to cover different things every day, and you get to meet really interesting people. And so my advice would just be, if you, if you do have the bug, you're probably not going to be able to escape it and just enjoy it and keep pre pushing yourself. Well, thank you, guys.